everyone. So first I'd like to thank everyone again for joining us on the celebration of Felix's life. I wanna say that though it's been 25 years since the passing of Felix, I personally feel his presence now more than ever. And with that being said, I truly believe he's with us here today. In the panel, which will be moderated by me, Mario Gonzalez, director of the Felix Gonzalez Torres Family Archive, and really representing the entire Gonzalez Torres family. We will present a glimpse into Felix's early life, emphasizing on his time in Puerto Rico, and we'll analyze how, in many ways, this very important period of his life laid the foundation for the work that he would go on to create in the early and mid 90s. This panel will be broken up into three parts, the first of which will be the first will be a, a loose conversation between Maria Martinez Cañas and myself, where we discuss some of the similarities or common ground that linked Maria to Felix early on, and that eventually led them to meet and become friends. We'll also provide a sense of what the general environment was like in Puerto Rico for artists in the late 70s and early 80s, which Maria and Felix were both very much a part of. Maria Martinez Cañas is a Cuban-born artist who, like Felix, grew up in Puerto Rico. She received a BFA in photography from the Philadelphia of College of Art and an MFA in photography from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She is an artist who works with innovative non-traditional photographic media and has exhibited extensively in the United States and abroad. She is the recipient of various notable awards, fellowships, and grants, and her works are included in the permanent collections of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Centro Pompidou, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, Center for Creative Photography in Tucson, Arizona, and the National Museum of American Art, just to name a few. For the second part of the panel, Liliana Ramos Collado, Collado, also a dear friend of Felix, will read an abridged version of her text titled Pulvis et Umbra Sumus, taken from Horace's Odes and translates to We Are But Dust and Shadow. Liliana Ramos Collado, PhD, writes on art, architecture, and curatorial practice. She is a full-time professor at the University of Puerto Rico School of Architecture. Previously, Liliana was the chief curator at the Puerto Rico Museum of Contemporary Art before becoming Puerto Rico's Minister of Culture. Liliana has curated some 30 full museum exhibitions and has written several books. Liliana has also curated many notable exhibitions and is currently curating an exhibition of Puerto Rican women architects for this upcoming fall. She has published extensively on cultural commentary, criticism, theory, photography, architecture, and culture in general, most of which can be found on her website, bodegoncontecladu.wordpress.com. Lastly, the panel will end with a presentation by Elvis Fuentes titled, Darling, Wish That You Were Here. Elvis has done extensive research on Felix's early life and work and has done a beautiful job linking the work of Felix with this formative period in Puerto Rico. Photography, close relationship with media, particularly the press, uh, the importance of the text as an image, dialogue with the tradi tradition of the poster, memory, migration experience in the family are all some of the themes that from very early on have been embedded in Felix's work. Felix is an art history professor and independent curator based in New Jersey. He graduated in art history from the University of Havana in 1999. His thesis of degree focused on the work of Caribbean artists living in New York, which included Felix. And upon graduating, he served as curator at the, at the Ludwig Foundation of Cuba from 1999 to 2002 before migrating to the United States. Also in 2002, Elvis wrote the first article ever published in Cuba about Felix. Between 2004 and 2006, he worked as a curator at the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture, where he conducted groundbreaking research on the early work of Felix. The result of the research was partially presented at the San Juan Polygraphic Triennial in 2004, and later at El Museo del Barrio, where he served, where he, where he served as curator until 2013. He currently teaches at uh, Rutgers University and is working on a dissertation on the afterlife of Soviet visual culture in Cuban art. And after Elvis' presentation, I think we'll have some time to answer questions as well. Uh, so Maria, if you're ready, please come on. Hi. I don't see you, Maria. Do you see me? I don't, but I hear you. Oh. <laughs> All right, so hi. So, so from our conversations, you know, some of the conversations we had in preparation for the event, uh, we did speak a lot on some of the similarities or common ground that linked you to Felix, such as being Cuban born artist growing up in Puerto Rico and having a lot of the same friends, things like that. Um, could you go into a little more detail on some of what, what these things were that linked you two together and what Puerto Rico was like, particularly for artists in the, in the 70s and early 80s? Well, um, I thought Puerto Rico was an extraordinary, energized, uh, culturally uh, place to personally for me to grow up. 
Um, I think it has a, a big significant to um, how I approach the medium of photography and um, what connects me with Felix um, early on was that we, we had many friends in common. Um, many Cuban born, Puerto Rican grown uh, friends, uh, also Puerto Rican uh, friends. And because he considered himself a photographer at least at the beginning of his career, okay? Um, and because I also consider myself to be a photographer, I think that that sense of photography was something that was really important for, uh, for both of us. Uh, we, did, we were in exhibitions early on together, but we did not have an opportunity to meet personally until a little bit later, and at that time was in uh, Miami. Um, so um, I think that Puerto Rico was, um, it offered also because of the way that the island is being isolated, be, being surrounded by water. Um, if you wanted to leave Puerto Rico, you either have to get on a, on a boat or a ship and, or take a plane. And that aspect of having to leave, you know, and embark on a journey was something that I think um, we understand very early, especially those of us that started our lives basically on a journey, um, a journey of moving geographically from one place to the other, having different cultures that create our identity, um, what makes us who we are. Um, I think that that had a, a big impact in, in both of our lives um, early on. Well, so yeah, so we can, so Casa Aboy, um, which we've talked about and you've alluded to being, you know, to playing an important role in, in Felix in, in both in both Felix and your work uh, amongst other artists and almost seems impossible to speak about this time in Puerto Rico without mentioning Casa Aboy. Um, yeah, so we could, you know, we'd like to kind of show some of the images. If you can go to the next slide, uh, Denise, please. Yeah, so that's Casa Aboy. Um, yeah. Maria, if you could talk a little yeah, bit about Yeah, let me, example. for those of us, for those of uh, people here in um, listening to this uh, panel, Casa Aboy was a, it started as a family residence uh, very early in the uh, early 20th century and um, belonged to the Aboy family in Puerto Rico. It's one of two of the oldest homes in Miramar, uh, Puerto Rico. And Ramon Aboy, who was, um, you know, the, the last of the Aboy that um, owned the place, create, he, he loved uh, photography. And, and, you know, it was a cultural center, but primarily on uh, photography. Um, I personally feel um, it is where I have my first exhibition. Um, and what started my uh, kind of career in photography. And for those, for some of us, it was the first, you know, where we have the beginning of our uh, career in uh, the medium of photography. So um, that was really um, important uh, for us. Um, are you moving the slides or? Um, yeah. 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 And, and if you can see that it's a residence because of that aspect of how it was. And uh, but we loved it because there there was something also that was very maybe because it was so small, maybe because it, we, we were a small community. The sense of of community was really important and the importance of Ramon to to find um, and support photography was very important uh, to to us. And and mentioning that he supported photography, it was not only conventional straight fo photograph, but those of us that challenged the notion of what a photograph is and what it means and what it symbolizes. That was really, really uh, important. Um, I wonder many times if it was not for my, for that I had that first exhibition there where I would have been today. So in many ways, we are very grateful um, for to Ramon Aboy for have giving us that opportunity to exhibit in, in this wonderful kind of um, community sense space that I thought was uh, terrific. Yeah, and I want to point out that Liliana, who's going to come on following our conversation, um, was very much a part of um, a lot of, you know, organizing these events that took place at Casa Aboy. And also from our conversation, you know, what we were talking about today, um, one of the architects that was involved in the design of the house was Antonio ne uh, Nechodoma, who was actually a student of Frank Lloyd Wright, which, which I thought was pretty interesting as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, Denise, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, so that is oh. Maria's, yeah. Yeah, that was, um, you know, I, I was 17 years old. 
Um, I went into, into Casa Aboy uh, because I wanted to see an exhibition of photography. I was together with a friend of mine. He belonged to Colegio San Ignacio, um, who was um, Felix. Felix had a lot of friends from Colegio San Ignacio. He was from, from um, San Jorge. And, um, you know, we, we have many friends that, um, you know, that they knew each other. And, um, you know, I, I went in and I love what I saw. And I told Ramon that I, I didn't even know who he was. And, and I just asked him that um, I would love to have an opportunity to have an exhibition there. And three months later, we were having a show there. And, um, and I loved it. But he was that open to, to um to experience and allow people that otherwise were not uh, known. And we were very young, we were kids. But I think that that freedom and that openness was what allowed us to really experiment with the things that we wanted to do uh, within the medium in uh, Puerto Rico. You know, Felix, Felix in many ways, I'm sorry, Felix in many ways um, was very interested in the idea of happenings, not necessarily conventional exhibitions where you will have the images uh, frame and put them up on the wall, but this idea of doing happenings around the island and around areas of the island. And that was also very important, this uh, participation or participatory aspect of his work within the environment in the island and the participation of the public within the work was also very important to him at that time. So this is what you guys are seeing here, Sueños con uh, Alaida y Felix. This is an installation that Felix did at Casa Boy, where he put a big block of ice in the middle of the room and he laid uh, shirtless um, with Alaida in, on, on the bed and as it melted onto the, uh, onto the, oh. the space. And, and I want to say that I always go back to this performance when thinking of the evolution, if you will, of Felix's work, because, you know, this is like a very early bed, a very early paper stack, candy spill, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, it was a one-time thing that got everyone's shoes wet as the ice melted and kind of forced people to participate. And, and you know, although he eventually, you know, physically removed himself from the work, you know, his, his, his personal, the personal was always just kind of there in the work, you know, he was always there. Um, so, yeah, so that's Ramon Avoy. On the left. Mm -hmm. You can go to the next one, Denise. That's just more pictures of Ramon Aboy. And then Eileen, this is a professor that, that both Maria and Felix had. Um, and you can kind of speak on that, Maria, please. We, you know what, it's as life presents many surprises and wonderful moments, um, you know, in life. Um, Felix and I had a teacher in common but me in Philadelphia, him in New York, I am totally convinced that Eileen had an extraordinary significance on his work because Eileen was a professor of language and image within the medium of photography. And um, she was also the head of the graduate program at the International Center for Photography and um, also taught a um, class on uh, feminism and photography. And, I know for a fact that Felix was very much interested in feminist art and he felt that it was very influential on his work. And Eileen had that kind of impact. Also another class that she taught at the ICP was the desire in language, which was a relationship between photography and writing. Um, I think that even though Felix started using text early, probably around 1980 or so, um, it is, I think, in 1985 that Eileen becomes um, her his uh, teacher. Um, Eileen was my professor from, um, I think, 1980 to 82 in Philadelphia, where I was doing my bachelor's, and then uh, went on to the ICP. So, um, you know, in, in many ways also, um, the influence that she had, and if you can put the next slide, uh, because it's one of her, um, it, this is one of her works, um, very minimal, very simple. Um, the use of line, the, the, the way of, of montage into the medium of photography, um, just combining the simplicity of text and image. It was something that was really important uh, to her. 
um, and that I think that it had a major influence on the work of uh, Felix. And so that's and the feminism in photography um, class you can barely see there, but in 85 at ICP and, and, and uh, Robert briefly touched on Ronald Barthes. And I think that it was through the influence of feminist art and theory that Felix mm -hmm. arrives at Ronald Barthes and, and the questioning the author and, and so forth. Yeah. This, and this, is, this belongs to, um, and Liliana also had something to do with this exhibition as she wrote one of the essays of the show, but La Nueva Fotografía Puerto Ricana was an extraordinary exhibition for a lot of us because it combined this group of photographers that very, very different, but very much um, just showing the public of how the new the new Puerto Rican photography was all about. Um, you know, this is in 1985, it traveled uh, through the island um, and, you know, in, in many ways brought a lot of attention to a lot of us uh, early in, in our career. And I think that if you go to the next slide, um, you will see um, this in, in the catalog of this exhibition, you have handouts that you can actually take out my work, it's a detail of one of a, of a larger piece. I'm the one on the left and Felix um, is the one on the right. What is interesting is that in this slide that we have here, um, our works were not together. They're just that for the presentation of the panel, they are here. But on the exhibition, on the actual opening night, they were exactly hung like that. I was on the left and Felix was on the right, which was really wonderful to see this idea for me at least as an artist because it kind of brought me back to the opening night uh, for the show. Yeah, so that's the, the last um, that's the last slide there, so. Um, okay, so see you later. So I think Liliana can come on now. Thank you. Thank you. Your, your, your intervention was beautiful right now. I loved it. Um, Maria, I liked it very much. Thank you. Uh, I have to write because I, I, I need to like some kind of structure. Uh, my, my small paper is uh, titled Felix Gonzalez Torres, Ulvis et Umbra Sumus. Uh, which means we are just uh, dust and shadow. Modern times are dustier times. According to Brian Dillon, the city of London endured nothing but an impure and thick mist accompanied by foginous and filthy vapors that threatened the health of all its inhabitants, at least since the mid 18th century. The situation got worse due to the seemingly unstoppable industrial revolution and the whole affair lasted until the mid uh, 20th century. This catastrophic mixture of humidity, ashes and dust endangered everyone's lungs, stomachs and especially the eyes. Everyone complained of having to feel their way along the city streets. The atmospheric condition was constantly discussed in the press. J. M. W. Turner's painted skylines in many ways point to cloudy heavens in constant turmoil, extravagant shades of colored light that strove to imitate the actual phenomenon of an indescribable sky. To quote Hubert Amish, quoting Brunelleschi, Turner would on principle exclude real clouds from the domain of what was depictable. Thus, darkness was the order of the day Many novels, including those of Dickens, dealt on this impossible atmosphere. John Ruskin himself feared for old and new buildings, the forest nearby, and the actual danger of taking a stroll in a park. The image of the city, any city, became a constant challenge to vision more than a century ago. Right now, we still complain of Manhattan's murkiness Mexico City's scandalous and unstoppable pollution, and the present day Roman filth. It bears noting that this mid century uh, 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 dust appealed enormously to the new art of photography, as witnessed by the early photographers who wielded cameras that were very slow to record an image. 
Travelers from Maxime Ducan and Gustave Flaubert from Robert Frank to Lee Friedlander bear witness to dusty cities and dusty city shops. Walking down dusty streets became a challenge for people who had to work in the impossibly unbreathable air within the many factories that dotted the cityscape. Budding photography captured, or better yet, froze, not only the movements of the crowd, but also the unpredictable movements of soot and dust that relentlessly swirled in the air. Possibly the most engaging photo of dust is the one taken by Man Ray of Marcel Duchamp's Grand Vert. When he finished this work, Duchamp exposed it to the outside air and it eventually became totally covered with dust. He asked Ray to photograph the surface of the Grand Vert. Duchamp dusted part of it, then sealed the glass so the dust would stay inside. And finally, the work was sold to the Museum of Modern Art in New York. In many ways, Duchamp's Dusty Grand Vert was the first in a long line of artworks that dealt with dust. Félix González Torres would also embrace dust in his, in his oeuvre. The city art of Félix González Torres bears witness to the present banality of everything and everyday urban decay. In his first urban statement on pollution published in a local newspaper in Puerto Rico. He stated his theoretical and methodological interest by quoting from previous artworks by the likes of Robert B. Smithson artists with a special emphasis on secondary genre. In 1980, Felix published a full newspaper page with an artwork titled Environ Smile, uh, uh, um, mental pollution. The newspaper page showed six identical dusty and grainy photos that showed a huge drainage spill right on the splendid San Juan beach. The photos were shaped like TV screens and underneath he wrote a romantic dialogue that read like a misogynist thriller including commercial ads and newscasts. To the, a, to, the, to the right, a text explained how this gigantic artifact mysteriously appeared on the beach. A sign read, polluted waters, swimming, bathing, water skiing, fishing, thinking, or meditating are not allowed within 200 meters from this sign. After moving to New York to study at the Pratt Institute of Art, Felix worked as a pizza delivery boy on heavily dusty streets. Dust was present in Felix's mind from the moment he moved to Manhattan. We frequently talked on the phone and he constantly told me that Manhattan was always gray and dusty. There's dust everywhere, he repeated. I can't understand how people are able to breathe here. Dust kept coming up in his work. In the late 80s, once he was diagnosed with AIDS, his interest in dust and dirt increased and many of his late works bore intense metaphors related to this dust epidemic. His dusty photographs and billboards of bed pillows and actual birds, dark clouds and family moments, self-portraits and happenstance shops allowed for a deliberate dustiness to settle on them, even as gestures aimed at huge photo shots of plain grain. His roaming eyes looked out for dust, pointing to his slow end. Following the hundreds of photographers who since the 19th century embraced black and white photography and incorporated actual murkiness in every shot, in 1991, Felix welcomed the dusty fallout as an allegory of his own life. On his real pillows and bedspreads, he collected flakes of his own skin, stains of his body, sweat, his hair, and whatever else would seem dust-like matter. On the 20 huge billboards he distributed through Manhattan, London, Germany, and many other urban spaces, dust and other tiny matters stuck to the billboards and hung in there until eventually another photo took its turn. Most of the pillow billboards were placed right in the middle of New York City clutter, among chain bicycles, next to municipal trash bins, 
parked cars, trees, dead or alive, other smaller plants, or at unremarkable spots, always or along speedways where no one would have those two seconds to focus their eyes on these billboarded empty beds. The pillow billboards became an eerie image, almost impossible to decode. Any unmentionable object could be placed right next to these billboards, especially those placed almost at street level. Eventually, due to repetition, the pillow billboards themselves became invisible for most of the community as almost everyone lost his or her interest in deciphering the what, the what of this strange photo. An intimate, <coughs> sorry, though deserted homey scene where two people now absent had slept together sometime. Nobody would still ask, did they go to brush their teeth? Um, is this morning or night? Who slept on the right side, Who's, who on the left? Where is that apartment located or is it a house? Did they move out? Did one go and the other stay? Is this a happy picture or is it not? Why are those billboards all over town? Why am I staring at that piece of weird thing? <coughs> Sorry, I'm a little bit loud. My question is why Felix wanted to post a mystery on this billboard, or is it rather a secret? Mysteries usually belong to happenstance or to spiritual maneuvers, but secrets, well, mm, those are created by people. I mean, by you and me. In fact, in, in an exciting book by Timothy McCall and Sean Roberts on the visual culture of secrecy, the authors pose this. Secrecy has always been a driving cultural force pointing to the centrality of milieu ranging from alchemy to statecraft, medicine to theater. There was a commitment to look beyond the contents of secrets to shed light to the act of, and means of their disguise and revelation. But the revelation of the secrets was as significant and efficacious as their initial invisibility and hiddenness. Secrecy was and remains not simply a matter of differentiating public from private information. Secrets, of course, require disparate publics that are socially demarcated. They also require the construction of boundaries that can only be actualized by their crossing." End of quote. <clears throat> Though some of the authors included in McCall's anthology of secrecy go far and wide to attach the concept of secrecy to diverse and sometimes awkward instances or activities, what, with, what interests me vis-a-vis -vis Felix's billboards seem to play a double or an antithetic anti game with, on the one hand, an artist's joke, and on the other, uh, with a painful wish to mourn. The artist wishes to tell us a secret. Who is sleeping on those pillows? Suddenly, it is not the dirt and dust on the billboards, nor the suit catered by speedy cars and trucks, not even the foul smell of rotten garbage billowing up to smudge the photo on the billboard, as usually as trashy dust behaves. No, the thing is that the catch is the secret and it is just a small group of people who might understand. This is the morning ritual of two gay men. Not only that, one of them, Ross Laycock, Felix's partner, had died of AIDS in 1991. After he posted the billboards, Felix told me, that one is Ross, without pointing to any of the pillows. Felix was calm and talked slower than usual. I asked which one, and he said, we were like twins or two in one. I had met Ross only once and it was a long and splendid night in San Juan and then he died. I was just standing there close to Felix. I was speechless and trying hard not to cry. So what if we interpret the bewildering billboard showing an empty bed with two recently depressed pillows as an artist joke? Maybe that's a quite sad, artist joke, in fact, tragic, 
certainly not adorned with happy laughter, but a weird and cruel joke hovering on the threshold of irony. As Pierre Bourdieu suggests in this scathing book on taste, and quote, humor expresses our place in society and our social origins. Heike Munder adds in a splendid essay that some humor is addressed to renewal and acceptance and adds, factions of the feminist and gay movements have made gains using humor. This form of humor only hurts those who feel attacked. The most intelligent form of humor is subversive, that of the snipers, and here infiltration occurs from within the ranks, affirmatively not inciting revolutions, but incurring a subtle incremental change instead." End of quote. Felix might not agree, for he was in pain during this acutely tragic moment, but something broke and there was a secret on many billboards that felt ironically like a bad joke, not by the artist, but a joke created by fate. Visual culture can play us a trick now and then, whether it is a secret we cannot comprehend or be it a joke that suddenly comes from the netherworld. There is another joke standing on the wings. In a splendid and tiny book, Michael Marder examines dust as materiality as a cyclic historical event and as a philosophical instance of great death that explores our presence vis-a-vis -vis that of dust in the cosmos. Felix would agree with most of Marder's propositions, for example, and I quote Marder a few times, dust, in dust makes space appear. Dust not only devours the shimmering of the objects it covers, eclipses their glow, blunts their edges and causes their lineaments to vanish by encasing them. Hmm? Dust immerses us in immanence, sealing up the gap for transcendent aspirations. And it creates a situation where the seeing and the seen are materially entwined, both because it hails from the bodies of the subject and the object alike, and because it hesitates on the threshold between the visible surface and the invisible precondition of sight. Felix knew all about dust. It brings forth the city itself. It marks all that is in the process of being blown away. Dust is some kind of reclamation. Your dust, my dust, all of our dust is always what remains of the has been. We leave our human mark with dust that will eventually disappear. And then we will not know for sure which is or or was my dust or your dust. And then dust reminds us of what we are and what we will become again and again. That is why we keep, we are to keep remembering and we will remember. Thank you. Uh, so now if Elvis can please uh, get on. All right. Hi, good afternoon, uh, everyone, everybody. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Silvia uh, and Mario for the invitation to participate in this uh, wonderful uh, event. Um, I um, wanted to begin, um, you know, with um, a very brief summary uh, of some of the uh, interesting connection that I see uh, in the work of Felix Gonzalez Torres, that uh, you know, early work that he realized in Puerto Rico, um, in relation to the work that is uh, much better known, uh, is uh, uh, of course is the catalog work um, that he basically developed uh, later on uh, in New York. Um, and if I, I, I actually wanted to. Um, to point out that uh, some of the uh, references uh, of the early work that uh, are that uh, Felix developed in Puerto Rico uh, are really very rare to find, and they are in, in some of the um, uh, you know some of the important collections, of course, in Puerto Rico, the 
a collection of uh, Casa Boy precisely that was mentioned here before. Uh, the University of Puerto Rico where Felix uh, uh, studied uh, for, uh, you know, for three years. And it, it was really a very uh, uh, important, um, I would say source of information as well. Uh, the visual art program uh, uh, at the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture, because this is an institution that is going to be critical uh, for uh, Felix uh, Gonzalez Torres um, and his ability to uh, actually study in, in New York. He received a couple of uh, grants uh, from the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture. He um, uh, actually um, uh, went back several times and he at some point also wanted to do an exhibition there. It never took place, but um, it, it, you know, it was his uh, intention to do so. Uh, if we can um, change uh, to the to the next slide, please. Uh, so one uh, of the interesting um, uh, aspect of his formative work, and we call it like that formative work, because uh, um, this was uh, an early work. He was a student of art, but he was very much active. Uh, and one of the things that uh, I want to point out uh, as well is that uh, although um, we tend to think of um, his work in Puerto Rico or his stay in Puerto Rico from 1970 to 1979, when he moved to New York and began studying there, his presence in Puerto Rico was actually, uh, or remained much longer uh, until 1988. This is the last moment, of course, very late in the decade. This is the last moment when um, we have a, a, you know, notice of his presence in Puerto Rico and he was actively uh, participating there and, and, you know, through uh, organizing uh, exhibitions, organizing um, um, in, in particular, for instance, he organized a, a video um, series uh, as part of the uh, Congress of Astro Artists of Puerto Rico in 1986 and later on in 1988 he was also um, um, uh, uh, participating uh, with um, an exhibition of uh, Frida Medin, who was a, uh, another uh, photographer, a very good friend of Puerto Rico, uh, in, uh, sorry, of uh, Felix in Puerto Rico. Um, now, but um, so the scope is actually much, uh, um, uh, the span, I would say, is actually much longer. And what we're going to see is that since the very beginning, he has. Um, um, different mediums that he's exploring uh, as a student and later on as a, of course a, a, an artist that already participating in the New York scene in the late 80s. Uh, but at the beginning uh, his uh, focus was on performance um, and of course uh, uh, photography um, but he also um, uh, presented uh, the first ever exhibition, a solo exhibition of video art in Puerto Rico, which was of course groundbreaking. That was in 1980 uh, at the, um, you know, um, uh, and then he donated the videos to um, the um, department, you know, department of fine arts uh, of the University of Puerto Rico. Uh, we were uh, lucky to uh, actually have access to those videos that have been uh, preserved there um, thanks to Carmen Fischler, that was a very important professor of uh, art history, and uh, also curator, and, and was a, an instrumental person at the time for Felix. Um, she was a, a very important supporter and, a supporter, and actually lent him the first uh, video camera that he would use to produce some of the videos. Um, besides performance, photography, video, we have uh, uh, several works that he also realized very, uh, uh, you know, um, rarely documented of uh, installation work. Um, and there are some few um, works that have been um, preserved uh, of uh, male art. Uh, but what is really more important that connects uh, the work uh, this early work in Puerto, Rico, in Puerto Rico to um, all of his work later on in New York is, is interested in, in newspaper. Uh, he actually 
coin something newspaper art that was basically a type of uh, intervention or insert that he would do uh, in newspapers in Puerto Rico starting 1980 um, with a couple of uh, photonovelas. Um, now, another important aspect that uh, links uh, Felix Gonzalez's story, early work to the work that he realized later on is this focus on the media and the public sphere. He was very much interested in, in not only newspapers, but also, of course, uh, TV, mass media in general. Um, and in fact, um, the, the, uh, some of the first uh, work installation performance that he realized uh, included uh, elements uh, of uh, the uh, re related to TV, uh, also uh, related, uh, of course, to news uh, that he would um, gather from the newspapers. Um, and uh, another interesting uh, thing is this uh, um, uh, focus that he had uh, on po the public sphere, uh, in particular public spaces like public parks uh, and the beach. Uh, the public park in particular, uh, he began um, engaging um, viewers, pass, passer buyers uh, uh, in, in public parks at the University of Puerto Rico where he uh, realized um, a couple of performances. And one of them uh, actually, uh, not necessarily performing, was more like an intervention where he wrapped uh, an old tree um, and he wrapped just like a crystal, right? Like crystal sculpture. And he was just standing by and looking at the reaction of, the, uh, of uh, you know, the passerby people going back and forth. And some of them uh, were asking if there was a sculpture to be unveiled, that kind of thing. Uh, and he was uh, actually enjoying this sort of interaction with the public that, you know, of course they didn't knew, uh, they didn't recognize, of course, that it was actually just a, an old tree uh, almost like a dead tree that had been wrapped. Um, uh, at some point, um, he was also uh, again interested in the beach in, and realized several performances. Uh, Maria was talking about that before, uh, in which he presented himself as you know sort of like the um, the tourist visiting the island of Puerto Rico. This is uh, uh, later on where he's already living in New York. Uh, but what is interesting is that every time that he had the opportunity uh, to go to Puerto Rico, uh, he would try to do something. Um, we published a, chron a chronology, um, um, you know, when we realized um, uh, uh, an, an exhibition of uh, this early work at the Museo del Barrio and the chronology, you follow the chronology, you realize that um, every time there was a, you know, winter break or uh, spring break or summer break, he would go down to Puerto Rico and he would be doing something. Uh, so this is uh, at the same, of course, he was studying in New York, he was living in New York, uh, but he was also very much active in Puerto Rico. Um, and for the most part of what we're going to see is this uh, thrust, this interest in experimentation, uh, in photography and in graphic arts uh, in general. Um, now, this, uh, uh, the, another important point, as uh, you can see here, uh, is the embrace of democratizing techniques, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, such as uh, pre-making, uh, 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 video, you know, multiples of different kinds. Uh, and this is something that I believe has to do uh, with the very strong tradition of poster and pre-making in Puerto Rico, uh, where he had, uh, of course, the 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 the, for me, the formative studies uh, at the University of Puerto Rico um, that were uh, to become very very influential. And in part, um, this uh, explains a lot of the interest. Uh, also, these studies explain a lot of the interest uh, in text and the relationship between text and image, because uh, Felix uh, actually started as a student of uh, focus in literature literature, poetry. He took several courses uh, of um, um, creative writing. Uh, he was very much uh, interested and in the first year uh, of uh, at the University of Puerto Rico, he was very much focused on literature. Uh, he was also very interested in French, for instance. So there's some in very interesting things that, um, that uh, were uh, revealed by these, uh, uh, by these uh, research. 
Uh, now, uh, is it only in the second uh, semester where we're going to see the second semester at the University of Puerto Rico where we're going to see um, uh, him moving uh, or more interested in actually in performing arts. He actually took a course with Hilda Navarra, who's a very important um, a Puerto Rican dancer, um, uh, is um, was one of the uh, pioneers of modern and contemporary dance in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, he took a course with her, uh, of pantomime, so that show us, uh, of course, this uh, interest uh, um, early on uh, on uh, in performance. And he then began also taking uh, different classes uh, um, with um, painters like Luis Hernandez Cruz, who's a very well-known, very important uh, abstract painter uh, in Puerto Rico, um, as well as uh, other courses uh, in particular, and this is something that Robert Hobbes uh, were, was mentioning before, uh, or uh, Maria, he was very much uh, interested in theory uh, as part of that uh, overall aspect of uh, you know the uh, writing literature, uh, he was very much interested in, in theory. So, for instance, he took a course with Jose Buscaglia, who is a very well-known uh, 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 historian writing in Puerto Rico. Uh, that was called the the creative process as human behavior. Uh, so, we're going to see. Uh, next slide, please. All of these interesting and um, 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 I would say formative uh, aspect of uh, uh, you know of the education in Puerto Rico, then turning into a, a very um, um, I would say very focused laser focus uh, work in the importance of the image as something that is not innocuous is something that uh, we have to question all the time and this of course had to do precisely with this approach the, uh, uh, through a theory, uh, a theory through literature and the interaction between the two uh, this is a um, a, a, a manifesto, he called it like that, a manifesto, the image as product power that he published in 1981 uh, in Puerto Rico, the, during one of his visits uh, to Puerto Rico. Um, he actually, um, um, and this was following a couple of interventions, next slide please, um, where he was uh, using uh, this sort of like, um, um, a structure of the text and the image, um, and sort of like a photo novella. And this is something that is very interesting. We're going to see that Felix, at least at, that, at this point when he was in Puerto Rico, he was very much interested in a type of work that was uh, appealing, that was attractive, that uh, was also uh, in a way almost like uh, edging in, in, in on uh, head, uh, hedonism in, in a way. Next slide, please. Um, so this is, uh, this is the two of the um, uh, important inserts, right, that he um, um, had on the left is in El Nuevo Dia. This is a, a very important newspaper uh, in Spanish in, in Puerto Rico. And on the right is the San Juan Star, which is a, 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 a newspaper in English that still, you know, both newspapers still exist today. Uh, in Puerto Rico, and we're going to see how he's appropriating the photo novella. Uh, um, um, and someone mentioned, you know, Teo Freitas actually, a, a Puerto Rican artist mentioned uh, the work of Ad Adal Maldonado, is a very important photographer also from Puerto Rico that was uh, at this time as well appropriating the photo novella. This is something that we're going to see among many uh, photographers uh, in general. Now, what is interesting is that you can see the headline there on the right. Now you two can own an, or an original. And so next slide, please. So this idea of the newspaper art, he saw it as something that was collectible. There was no problem, you know, or, or uh, in his mind, there was um, uh, no limitation in the type of art that was reproduced that even in newspaper, right, that is so difficult to preserve, uh, as opposed to, you know, fine arts. So this, uh, uh, this uh, approach, you know, to experimentation is something that we're going to see over and over in this early work. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, what accompany um, uh, this uh, other insert. Uh, and in El Nuevo Dia, you can see August 24. So most of the interventions that we're going to see of 
Felix in Puerto Rico are precisely during these breaks, right? Summer break or spring break or a winter break. Uh, and this is a common, of course, and we're not going to have, you know, we don't have time to go over all of this, but uh, this is something that relates as well uh, to uh, the importance of the media. Uh, he is um, comparing here uh, this photograph of a pump that was, you know, um, basically pumping uh, uh, sewage, uh, you know, dark, dirty waters in, into the sea, uh, into the beach, actually, and he compared that with uh, the television. Next slide, please. Um, now, um, there is a series of uh, um, uh, works that he also did that uh, talk about the, the politics of images uh, and how important is for the public to question who is printing the image because you know it's, it's one thing uh, to have something photographed it's another thing to have something reproduced printed and this is something of course that uh, he um, uh, addressed uh, in a way by um, uh, you know accompanying in many cases these uh, the images with the with text uh, next slide please uh, <clears throat> on the fallacy of the nocus image, this is so. This is a quotation from um, from the from this manifesto. Uh, we're going to see uh, how he began questioning some of these traditional images that we associate as you know or, or we think of as inocuous, and he, uh, like the family pictures. That this is something that he's going to develop uh, later on, in life, for instance, in this uh, um, work uh, uh, of one of the apostles. Right. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but at the same time, he was doing a type of work that uh, would uh, um, engage uh, or use the newspaper, not just as a reference, but also as sort of like a backdrop. You can see this is a series of, um, of images that uh, is sort of like a story that, uh, that he um, realized uh, as well. And uh, well, we know we don't have um, uh, more time. Uh, this is a lot, uh, a lot of work. Actually, if we think in terms of uh, time, in terms of uh, span, the work in Puerto Rico. Um, uh, actually, uh, we're talking about um, uh, several years uh, in which he produced a lot uh, of work. So we're gonna leave it there. All right. So thank you so much, um, Elvis and Liliana and Maria. Um, so I'm gonna answer a few of the questions. We've gotten quite a bit, but I'll get to some of them. Um, so there was one um, that said, uh, did he have a connection to Miami? Um, and yes, most, most definitely um, he had a connection to Miami. Uh, to start, the majority of his family um, and closest friends live here in Miami, um, with the exception, of course, of his sister, Gloria, who lives in Puerto Rico. Um, you know, Felix bought an apartment in, on Miami Beach towards the latter, the later part of his life. Um, and when he became uh, very sick, he was eventually flew, you know, he eventually flew down mm -hmm. to Miami to spend his last day um, here close to his family and also um, in his work um, some of the images that you know that are used like some of the photos of clouds and things like that um, you know were taken in South Florida. There's a question here on uh, Ross on where uh, and when they met um, and I he met in 1983 they met in 1983 in New York um, and so uh, this last year on March 5th of 2020, commemorating Ross's birthday, we posted a quote on our Instagram from a conversation that I had with Carl George, who was a friend of both Ross and Felix, uh, where he recalls the first time he saw them together. So if you guys want to check that out, um, he goes into a little more detail. Um, so personal relationship to Felix. So I'm his nephew. Um, my father is Mario, who's Felix's older sister. And I think I noted everyone's relationship to Felix at the beginning of the, of the panel. Um, so I'd like to know more about his life as a child. Um, I think that's wonderful. Well, you know, and I want to say that one of the main reasons why the Family Archive was established to kind of serve as a resource for, you know, for researchers who seek this sort of information. And um, we just concluded a project with collectors where we included an interview with my aunt, Gloria, who provides some insight onto Felix's childhood and migrating to um, Spain, Puerto Rico, um, from Cuba, and she kind of goes into a little more detail um, onto Felix's early life. Um, but of course, if anyone wants more information on Felix's personal life, they can you know feel free to call or contact the, the family archive. I'd be happy to provide some insight. 
So I believe, um, I don't know if anyone has any questions for Maria Martinez Cañas, Elvis or Liliana, I'd be happy to. Okay. Um, if not, I believe we could. Um, Liliana, I want to say that I love hearing the cookies in the background of your video. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's, it's, I, I couldn't do anything about that. Yeah, you can. I know. <laughs> closed all the doors or the windows, or everything. <laughs> It adds and a they, great and touch. They stood, and they stood their ground anyway. <laughs> I thought it was beautiful, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so it was great. It was great to have them. Okay. Oh, thank you. I was, I was, I was like nervous about it. <laughs> no, I think it's perfect. <laughs> so uh, we could um, go on to the next panel. Okay. There's two questions in the Q&A. Let me see. Okay. So sorry. Um, so they said, I would love to read the work of Elvis and Liliana. Where can I find it? Um, if you guys want to answer that, Elvis and Liliana. What? Uh, so Carl George actually writes that he'd love to read uh, the work of Elvis and Liliana and where he could find it. I can, I, I, I can just send it to you if you want. You have it, I think. Well, I'll, I'll, okay, uh, Carl, uh, I know who's asking. So Carl George, feel free to um, contact me and I'll, I'll uh, okay. arrange it for you. Yeah, well, most of the, uh, you know, the research that we did was published in this small catalog. Oops, sorry, I didn't have it. Uh, and um, it's, um, I actually have still some few copies, um, but it's, there is also a PDF uh, that uh, can be, um, I, I believe the Felix Gonzalez Story Foundation it has uh, um, the PDF online. Uh, if not, I can, you know, I can send it. It's, uh, it also, I want to acknowledge Mario Nunez, um, who also uh, mm -hmm. just commented that he that he also did an insert in the New York Times in 1980. Mario Nunez was actually a, a really good friend of Felix as well. Mm -hmm. And on that note, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Cla Claudio Gonzalez and Rosa Valcera, um, who were also great friends of Felix. I was actually going to mention that it's interesting, and I, I asked uh, Doug for uh, about that, that uh, right after Felix uh, began a uh, group material, uh, the first uh, project that they did was an insert in the New York Times. And I, I'm mm -hmm. definitely sure that was Felix uh, mm -hmm. uh, pushing there, right, to have this sort of intervention that was so central to his work uh, since Puerto Rico. I mean, what is interesting is to see how um, uh, convincing he must have been. I'm always say this because, you know, a, a, a page, a whole page, two pages in, the, in a newspaper, any newspaper, we're talking about thousands of dollars in ads that the newspaper is uh, putting in the hand of an artist. So he must have been really uh, <laughs> convincing, right? Uh, uh, to, to obtain this kind of support. Mm 